Okay, so welcome to Odetta Petit and Audrey Stone's solo exhibition titled Gradient Crush. This is Odetta Petit right here. And it's a scale model of the Odetta Bushwick Gallery, which I created that space and did the build out in 2014. And when the pandemic uh, started to lock us all in, um, I needed to create some kind of an exhibition space that was pandemic proof. And artist Seth Callender out of New Haven built Odetta Petite for me. And parts are removable. There's a, there's a front wall that shows just like when you, you would have seen it in Bushwick on the street and so on. Um, so what Odetta Petite is built around is, is a concept much like an architect's model. And that is, I want to give artists an opportunity to have a solo exhibition with me. And also they need to be artists that are willing to take something in miniature and should we get a commission for this I, this work of art that they have to be willing to scale up with me to life size. So Audrey's gradient crush in real life would end up being approximately um, eight feet square because this is pretty much a, a, a circular spherical object. So about eight foot square and um, should a client reach out to me about this, Audrey and I have talked about the materials in depth and we've decided that for her, the best approach would be on a strong canvas again and painted. Should it go outdoors, we could move it into painted steel or aluminum. But for the present, if it were to end up in an indoor site like this, some corporate entryway, um, with a large atrium, it would be canvas painted. So um, I wanted to welcome Audrey. Uh, we set up an artist talk together that talks about her work. But I also want to encourage any of you artists that are in the room now with us or share with your friends um, that I am open to handling large scale sculptural installations and the idea of a solo exhibition at Odetta Petite. So if that is cooking in your mind, um, please let me know. I Audrey don't understand. reached out to me about two years ago and we started the conversation. Andra Samuelson, who's in the room with us, had the Odetta Petite space last year. And she, again, we talked for over a year before that exhibition opened. Uh, we opened with Seth Callender as uh, uh, it was an exhibition titled The Waters We Swim. And again, we were in lockdown still at that point as he was creating sculptures responding to that event in our world. Uh, the, the next show up was, uh, it was Suzanne Benton and it was Pioneer Activists and it was to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the uh, women's right to vote being passed. So she had key suffragists and activists from the 16th century on that were always working towards women's equal rights uh, and voting rights and financial rights. So then third in line was Andra Samuelson with Pemeron. And then this year it's Audrey Stone with Gradient Crush. So I get, I get to about one a year and the rest of my programming with the gallery has pr predominantly been virtual. I run Odetta Digital. So if you're an artist looking to travel your work and have it on Artsy, please follow up with me at your convenience. So now, Audrey, did you wanna say some words before I start sharing the screen with the uh, the slide presentation? Yes, thanks for Thanks for having me in Odetta Petit. It's, uh, you know, it's a space that I always love the idea of. And um, thanks to anyone showing up today. So happy. So if you have any questions during the talk, everyone, just put them in the chat. And we'll have uh, a, a 
basic dialogue moving through the uh, slides as they're presented and some wrap up with uh, some discussion at the end as well. So questions in the chat, please mic your, or turn off your audios now and we're gonna share the screen. Move this up to the beginning. What I wanted to do, Audrey, was just feature you talking. Um, I think that'll come on. Let's see. Okay. Welcome, Audrey, to Small Talk. Thanks, Ellen. Sorry we're not in person. We were going to be in person, but it didn't work out today. But we're all zooming in from all over, so that's cool. Um, I wanted to start the talk with some images of my paintings. Um, so some people might be familiar with my paintings um, and some people might not. And also go back to the brick and mortar space of Odetta. Um, this, is, this is the space that Odetta Petite is modeled after. This is Odetta in its, on its Cook Street Bushwick location incarnation. And this is a shot of works of mine from the show Mesmerize, which was a group shy, shot, a group show there in 2018, including the works of Elizabeth Borlay, Stephen Main, and um, myself as paintings on the wall. And Carol Salmonson had a light piece that you can see if you look at the very top left of your screen, there's a purpley light and that's part of her installation that was above the windows so the windows would have been to the left of the screen and the back of the space towards the right um this is from the left press to center flow close still and press are the paintings on view there so i deal a lot with gradients over the years and colors my main concern and um, using gradients to to manipulate the colors and have them interact. And symmetry is also a big part of a lot of my compositions. This is another shot of the space uh, of that show. On the right is a little painting called Bulge. It's 20 by 16. So this is when you were in the back kind of hallway of, around from the back space looking towards the front of the space. Um, I do feel like some elements of that little bulge painting happen in the gradient crush pieces in that like one area of color overlaps another area of gradient, which is something that um, these pieces with forms that come out of the gradients at some point do. And I think of it as like a, a little bit of a disturbance within the piece or, or a, a a uh, dissenter or a, I forgot what I used to call it. Do you remember, Ellen? Interrupter? <laughs> a disruptor, thank you. A disruptor of, the, of that gradient. So this is a diptych called Double Pour uh, from 2019. And um, I thought it was a good example of my, uh, how I'm really interested in visual vibration with the color and um, and that I've been using diptychs uh, for a while as mirroring, as um, a way to express kind of a unity, but with separate elements at the same time. Um, so the purple strip on the left pours down over the colors. On the right, the canvas, it's the bare canvas, goes up through the colors. And that's um, kind of an opposite an opposing thing that happens with them, within them. And I love the visual vibration that the gradients give in that I feel, I feel it in my body as, uh, as vibration when I'm looking at, at the work. Yeah, and for me, um, I just wanted to point out because I asked Audrey, um, the, the lavender line that runs down the middle of the, the painting on the left 
actually the color is the same stable from top to bottom but the illusion of colors interacting gives it an abrash effect yeah color interaction <laughs> yeah um i wanted to show this slide of uh, three different paintings from the close series over time. I do tend to work in series over time uh, where I revisit a composition and play it out in different colors. So the structure of the painting basically stays the same, but the colors change. So obviously one from 2019, 21, 23. Um, these have been going on since 2018, I believe. So. And here's um, three close paintings that were installed at Odetta when Odetta was in the first Dibs building in Chelsea. This was from a show called Radiant, including the works of Anne Rusinoff and Elizabeth Gourley. So it was really great to have three of them together. These were all early ones from the series. So they were all available at the same time, whereas doing series over a long period of time, it seems like they just kind of get shown here, there, wherever, one or two. Um, so it was nice to have, like, to feel like um, they were all together. And I wanted to also mention that my work does, while it has a very formal look to it when you're um, looking at them, of course, there's a, a lot of structure, there's uh, a lot of formal elements since abstract and geometric, the underpinnings in terms of how I approach it are uh, often come from like um, emotional life and feeling. So the title close refers to a point in time when my mother was very ill and people would always, not always, but people would ask me, are you close to your mother? And at the time it was very heightened. And I thought like, why? It was as if, you know, being close to someone who's ill validates one's experience of that experience of, going through that with them. So I was really examining the word close at the same time as creating these color compositions and um, using color to feel out how does, what does it mean to be close? Close and, to the painting as well. There's always a parallel to painting. Where... And it was very important to Audrey for this installation that the three be together as we were installing in that space. And I was, very happy to have an opportunity to do that for Audrey and especially because of this close series and its emotional connection for her. Thanks. Thanks, Ellen. Um, here's th another threesome. These are ceiling, like as in the ceiling above paintings, one, two, and three. The yellow one was the first and the blue and then the pink, I believe. Um, they... Uh, one thing I want to point out is the top edges of these. If you, I don't know if you can see it on your little screens, but they're not taped. They're more feathered, uh, whereas the bottom angle, the angled edges going in, I'm talking about. Um, so that was, that's a new element in my work where I'm experimenting with taping and not taping. I've been a taper. I've always thought of my work as soft edged because I, I don't do hard taping. I, I allow for bleed underneath the tape. And um, and now I've removed the tape in places of the paintings and I, I'm playing with the edges a little more. So here's an instance in terms of composition where the central color is the same, but the outer colors obviously differ and using those basic red, yellow, blues. And also of course the title ceiling referring to the above and as a woman what is it, the connotations? What does the ceiling mean to us as a woman? What does it mean to me? And I wanted to also show the some works from this series called By Fire, but uh, not all my series have the same uh, composition. This was a series that had multiple compositions, each one varied. Uh, this was the By, the By Fire series <clears throat> is titled after repeatedly listening to Leonard Cohen's Who By Fire's uh, song. Uh, the song is, uh, was, uh, he was inspired by the Unatana Tokif, which is a Hebrew prayer said each year during the high holidays. 
Um, and so my paintings were inspired by both of those. They're directly uh, related to them, but also using my own riffs on the poem and the song. There's 18 paintings in the series, 18 being the Hebrew um, symbol, num numeric symbol for life. And since the series revol uh, revolves around death, basically, it's like who's who by fire, if you don't know the song, who's going to die by what instance? And um, so since the whole series was about death and mourning, I thought it was important to tie it into life as well at the same time. So I used 18 paintings. And I have to just mention that numbers do play a role in my work at times. I've done series, end them with certain numbers at times. I did a series called Rome recently, which uh, has seven paintings in them. And my father was born in Rome on 7 7 27. Um, so I ended it at seven, and seven is a lucky number. It was his lucky number. So numbers, and then, and I'm always counting in my work in terms of making the gradients and how many bands it's going to take for me to get across the painting. Sometimes it's more felt, and sometimes it's more calculated, but I'm always counting. So numbers are important. Um, from the top left, you have by hand, uh, by song, by sunshine, by, excuse me, by fire, the top right. Uh, there were three by fires within the series. The bottom left is by sunshine, by stone, and by sleep. Uh, these were shown at Morgan Lehman Gallery in 2020-21, that winter. Right, and that was, I, I mentioned to you yesterday, Audrey, I think that was the first exhibition I went to after lockdown because of my um, commutes back and forth to the Midwest and and just galleries just re-emerging. Um, it was it was great to be able to see your solo exhibition. Um, the other thing I want to say about counting is that in itself when painting is it sounds like that's a real meditative space for you when you're in the act of painting and keeping track. Would you would you speak of, speak to that a little bit? Um, I guess you could say that at times it is, it is, um, it is kind of methodical. Well, it's definitely methodical. Uh, it depends on how big the numbers are because sometimes I'm counting high and that's hard to keep track of sometimes in terms of focus. So in that sense, it is, I guess, a meditation that you could call. Yeah. If you've just come into the uh, the room, kindly mute yourself. I'm hearing one person's audio is still on. This is a painting called uh, Passing Through. I wanted to include it because um, as another series, I have done a number of paintings that are squiggles and um, through, the word through refers to the fact that these paintings are very strenuous for me to complete. Um, so I feel like I've actually gotten through something when I've completed one. So it's a little bit of an internal joke on me. You made it through. And also I think of them, I, they tend to punctuate other bodies of work. Like I'll be done with something and I'll say, well, maybe I'll do it through. I get the urge to do one of these. And um, I'm actually gearing up to to do one now, I think you never know, uh, but uh, I'm making studies. So, uh, and so I think of them almost as also like a shamanic thing that happens in the studio, like to punctuate a time or as if I was, um, you know, saging, saging my space. I'm, I'm throughing my space or throwing a painting. That kind of thing. Just needing to shake it off before the shake next one. Off. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is three images of the same painting called No, No, No. Is this center one, the center composition was just shown in my show called Together and Apart at Morgan Lehman Gallery, which closed yesterday. Um, it's four panels, 30 by 20 each that are painted all consecutively in a row, the same composition. And in the end, I figure out how they're going to be. I play with them as if they're a puzzle. How, how do they move together? Um, 
and I'm never sure when I'm painting them exactly how these four panel pieces are going to be shown. So I enjoy that open-ended feeling of uh, what's it going to be. I mean, I do do sketches beforehand to see how the pieces will fit together, but you never know even with those how, how they're going to actually look and how, what's going to make sense. Um, I have opened it up on the social media, as some of you are probably aware of, that um, the compositions, I'll post a bunch of varieties of uh, how, they're, how they can fit together and ask the uh, Instagram community which one people prefer, which has been really fun to have people poking into my studio um, and also to get feedback of what, what resonates with other people, even though I might have what I think is is the um, composition I want. It's interesting to hear other people's um, interpretations and and I've enjoyed that element. Um, there's kind of an endless way to show these pieces. Also with them, I, uh, with the four panel paintings, what I've been doing is uh, in this piece in particular, and you might be able to see it slightly on your screens if you didn't actually see it at the gallery. But um, the first panel was completely taped, both, both edges up and down. The second panel, the short edge was not taped, but the long end was. The third panel, the long edge was not taped and the third one, the top, the short one was. And the fourth panel, none of it was taped. So in this composition, if you go to the middle one, the top right one is all taped and the bottom left, the top left one is all taped and the bottom right one is not. So there's kind of like a fraying of the structure a little bit. And that was actually part of my intention is, is like, it's like uh, myself decomposing in some way, like my um, idea, uh, these, these structures of these paintings go back to earlier paintings that you saw, say they relate very closely to the close series and other uh, paintings I've done. Uh, but they're halved each panel. Um, I'm getting into a loophole where I'm not sure where I'm going. But uh, well, I, you're you're trying to say that that this diffusion that you're incorporating is echoing your feelings of degrading of the self. Is that well, to do with aging, or is that to do with just exhaustion yeah. as in life, motherhood, painter? Where uh, well, there is that element, but what I was really meaning to say was the idea of Together and Apart, which is this uh, title of the show, is the sense of holding oneself together while things seem to be falling apart. So the sure. world is falling apart and um, around us, it feels like, and yet yeah, I'm, I'm together, I'm holding it together. I'm continuing, which is feels very strange these days to be, you know, in my studio painting while all the stuff is hitting the fan, you know? So together and apart and also that like uh, in our individualism and then in relation to other people as well. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes during the most difficult periods in an artist's life, I think about um, Miro's constellations, mm. those those works on paper, the gouache, those are some of my favorite paintings of his. And that is when he was in a very chaotic time in his life. Uh, I think it was right around R World War One, and he, he was in a, a refugee at certain times, I believe. And yet these constellations were being made, uh, these paintings. So sometimes, that that solace that you seek happens right in the studio. It's the most accessible way to to still yourself and comfort yourself. For sure, I think for creatives, for sure, that's mm -hmm. definitely where we do. And thank you for bringing up the Moros. I'm going to go look at them. <laughs> I'll Google them tonight. Um, this is Mirror Mirror, which was also in the show at Morgan Lehman Gallery that closed yesterday. Diptych. I've also been working with diptychs. So the top half of this painting is taped and the bottom half is not. And I 
They're different sizes too. The top is 40 by 30 and the bottom is 30 by 30. Um, so it has this kind of quality of melting away at the bottom and, and being more ref kind of like shimmery. The whole painting kind of shimmers, but um, in not taping, it kind of really softens it even more. Um, that upper composition, the bottom composition, again, it's something that I've worked on again, but to mirror it really changes it. So um, this was a period where I was just kind of thinking about what have I done and where am I going and uh, putting it together through these paintings. And now we go back to Odetta in Bushwick in the back room where during Mesmer Mesmerize, we showed two gradient crush pieces um, it was, a, I think, a fun surprise to open the drawers and see these pieces. Um, Ellen and I had both been in a show called at In Case Projects that was curated by Eddie Yanev and Jane Crimmins. And I think that was earlier that year, actually, when I look back at my photos. Um, and I did a gradient, my first gradient crush was in that piece. So, uh, you know, I loved always Ellen in your programming that you encouraged artists and really got into whatever elements of play people, uh, artists were working on. And we had a lot of fun just talking about where Gradient Crush could go at Odetta, in the bookshelves, over here, wherever. And we, we did two, I made two for the flat files. So that was, that was where Gradient Crush started at, with Odetta. There. At that time, too, Audrey was so excited about filling these drawers to the brim. I mean, they were really packed in there. Yeah. Um, and we talked about her her fantasy of being able to fill a gallery space with a gradient crush. So we're we're still working on that. <laughs> we yeah, have it in miniature. <laughs> But but uh, it's it's a great concept, very playful. Audrey's work is so rigorous that to have an outlet to just let off a little of that tension into something unknown, um, it's been a, a real exciting part of her painting practice. Yeah, I mean that's you kind of hit the nail on the head because the paintings are are pretty um, rigorous. And, uh, you know, there's a certain process that needs to happen. It's nice to have something that's really loose. This image is of the gradient crush from the previous slide on the right, that when it came out of the drawer, it was a real, they were real solid objects, which I loved. And it ended up hanging in my studio like this for some time because it held its form. And this is how um, our current gradient crush at Odetta Petite started with, I paint a flat gradient and that's how they start. And then I figuring out the colors and then we cut the shape and uh, started playing around in the space of Petite Odetta. <laughs> and the, that first uh, gradient, it ended up being too uh, thick. It was, the canvas was too heavy. We did this, um, landscape one which I'm looking back I really like it we both really liked it but it wasn't what we had in originally intended and it wasn't very malleable it was having a hard time moving so I had to go home and paint another one and uh, this one this one is doing something else now <laughs> so I made I went home painted another one came back and here we are installing the one that ended up in our show at Odetta Petit um we did the back room too. You can see me fitting the back room there, photographing it. Um, so it's ideally something that, and if you can imagine yourself in the gallery in that little space, um, you would encounter as a monumental thing and it would be taller than you and yeah. it would have different folds. There's a view from the outside. You'd walk around it. Um, slow down, Ellen. Oh, okay. I wanted to get to that back view. Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, this is a view. Uh, I think I already said this is the view from Cook Street in Bushwick looking in. And um, there's the back room where uh, we had 
I filled the whole space of the back room with a gradient crush, which Ellen is calling son of gradient crush. <laughs> um, or who, anyway, maybe it's offspring. I don't know what it is, but um, I Could call it homunculus. <laughs> I love the idea of like completely filling a space so that you could barely enter. I guess you could stand in a little corner there in that space. Um, like, how would that feel? Would it be uh, intimidating? Would it be seductive? Would it be sinister? That's uh, who knows how it would feel. And whereas the other one would be something to move around. I also love the way that how, if you go back, you can see how the different areas of color gradient colors uh, interact in these pieces. Whereas in my paintings, it's all uh, a sweep across the thing and they interact vertically, horizontally, however it's painted and you feel that kind of vibration. In these, you're getting the colors directly um, visiting each other in different ways. So that's fun for me as someone who's really excited and interested in color to have, like to push that blue up against the yellow and see how it feels, you know? And in the end, that big idea of the monumental sculpture here at Great Odette Petit, Petit is just a little object. And I, I love that playful notion of fantasy. I think as artists, we all need to really imagine. So it was a great opportunity to imagine and perhaps one day um, it will come to fruition, but until then, I'm enjoying just playing with Gradient Crush, and here we are in the studio, how that piece has just kind of, over time, found various situations to, to be played with in the studio. And that's Gradient Crush. Thank you so much for uh, taking us through this uh, period of, of exploring the Gradient, Audrey. Awesome. I'm going to stop the screen share and um, see if we've got any questions in the chat. Uh, and uh, I think it's safe now for people to unmike. So if you'd like to go ahead and ask a question, you can do that. And um, welcome everybody. Good to see your faces. Any questions from anyone? You can unmike and ask away. Okay, I think people understand this very well. Um, go ahead. Okay. Um, all right, well, Audrey, thanks. It, it's been a, a great day here to start the day on a snowy, wet, kind of a, a stormy day and have a chance to share your work with everyone. And um, and Odetta Petit, again, I'm open to proposals. You have to be an artist that is willing to take a monumentally scaled work and shrink it down into petite size. Right here, right here. Here's our, thanks Sandra, we have a, a human scale. For you. And I think, um, sorry, uh, Jessica had a question in there in the chat. How she missed the beginning. How did you switch from canvas to 3D? Um, hey, Jessica, I imagine, is it Jessica from Israel? You can unmute. Um, hey. Yeah, yeah, yes, it's me. I, I didn't mean to, to make a deal. How are sorry. you? so nice to um see you here um they they start as a as a flat painting and then they get crushed into shape into into a more sculptural form so it's kind of one of those things where is it a painting is it a sculpture what is it exactly and it's a painting that turns into a sculpture and it's just a playful thing uh that i've done in the studio Turns out very great, very great. I really appreciate to see like kind of a cloud, you know, of, it's really fascinating. Oh, good, thanks. I can't, I can't pull up the chat for some reason. So Audrey, um, go ahead and, oh, here we go, finally, okay. That was just the one thing I, that popped up when you were 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no. I don't. I I don't really have a question, but I just have great appreciation for having seen your process. I always think of art as a process rather than just seeing one object here or one object there. And I, I'm quite fascinated as to how you um, keep pushing the ante. You know, you keep changing within your paintings, and. Um, I, I love this three these three three dimensional um, manifestations of your work. I um, I understand having also exhibited at Odetta Petite that um, these are kind of models for larger works, but I I think they also are not just models. I think they're uh, there's a kind of wonderful intimacy about the small miniature object. And, um, you know, I could see a show of these tiny models <laughs> uh, all together. So anyway, I just wanted to thank you very much for sharing your process with us. It's very inspiring. Yeah, what, what happened, the history of those summer large scale sculpture shows at Odetta in Bushwick the artists that were working on those sculptures, the rule of thumb was you can't walk it in to the building. You have to build it on site. It needs to be at that scale. Can't come through the door. So um, when artists were working on those plans, they would bring their model that they built of Odetta and um, and show me where, where they were in their process and decision-making. And so I had hoped to close that gallery in 2019, that space with an exhibition of all of the artists that made a model of Odetta to curate their own exhibitions of other artists' works, get the miniatures, even if it's in just a, a Xerox printed form, um, but to set up exhibitions that I was gonna show the five Odetta curated shows by uh, guest artists that had done large scale work. And I ended up not being able to pull that show off. It, my programming went right through to the end of the lease. Um, but here we are, we, we've got it in part. So, and I do have three Odetta models. So at some point I'm going to be able to pull this off. <laughs> That'd be great. Okay. I, 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 think we're through any questions that require answers i have a i have a quick question just okay, about right. um about your taping um that was interesting i've forgotten you had talked about that transition of going from taping to not taping so i assume by not taping you're creating the same lines but you're just painting them freehand yeah right yeah. How's that going? Do you find yourself over time being able to be more and more steady or are you steadier? Were you steadier than you thought you'd be from the get go? And you're like, oh, why did I ever tape? But let me keep doing this because it's an interesting exploration or. Um, well, I'm not trying to be steady because I want there to be some edge. Mm -hmm. some fluttering. That's the point of not taping. Um, it's just a, I think also a little bit of a funny like painter's qualm, like a little meta thing of, you know, there's, I think amongst abstract painters, there's uh, a lot of attitude about taping. For me, I've always felt like a tape is another tool, just like my brushes and my paint and my canvases are. I don't, um, but some people are adamantly, you should never tape. Other people are like, you, you know, you've always got to tape. Um, <laughs> and so, it's it's kind of like having a little discussion about it for me, but it really had to do with just um, being a little more intentional about the edges and seeing how um, how that would shift, like soften. Because I think of them as soft edge painting. I don't tape for a hard edge. I think I said in this talk, like I tape I tape with bleed. I feel like the bleed house allows the painting to breathe. 
in a way that hard edge painting uh, sometimes doesn't feel that way to me. And um, so softening it even more is just a way to kind of ask that question to myself and to see it, to see, to see how that would work. I'm still experimenting with it. Um, when I'm curious about the math of the thickness of each radiation, is that, are you doing that by eye or is that measured when you do it? So yeah. even when you do it by hand, it's still measured. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, uh, I mean, like I measure... And then sometimes I get to a point in painting, I'm like, oh, I need to like figure out these measurements because if I want the color to go, I, I think of the color as gaining like height, like right. you to get to a certain volume between one pure color and another color. And to get there, sometimes I have to manipulate those measurements in a different way. It's like, oh, I'm getting too big or I, or I need to get tighter because I wanna, I really wanna get to that blue and I'm, at least six steps away from it so and sometimes there's not room i've had that uh experience where there's not room and and, and measurements uh i like that the mis that the mistakes in my paintings can change the course of the paintings and mm -hmm. they, so it's allowing for kind of like mismeasurement or sometimes you know uh like i i I will inadvertently paint the wrong color too too close in, if that makes sense, and then the different step than the gradation would be, and it's left there. I don't go back typically. I'm always moving forward in the paintings, um, so I feel like there's those. I feel like those mistakes are little keys in in the paintings for for the handmade. In a basically, because I think people look at my paintings and think, oh, they're so perfect or whatever, but they're really not, you know. Yeah, I remember that even from the earliest times I showed your work in the flat files, you always left a little bit of a blip of the understory color that might seep out at one of the edges. And that was very intentional. Um, but uh, that happy accident occurring. Yeah. I guess for folks that are more gestural artists, that's kind of all over their paintings, right? Like, you know, just these happy accidents. I know. But even in yours right now, the way you're diffusing and allowing the, the understory to start showing through and the brushwork to start showing more and more, uh, you're, you're, you're in that ilk slowly, but surely in that you want to show stages of process. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say I was, um, uh, something stuck in my head of your answer to my question about, um, rules and art, you know, people's debate over you should always tape. You should never tape. You should taping is okay. Taping's not okay. So many there's so many things we butt up against, right? In terms of the rules of art, and oh, we must never break them, or we should always break them. That'd be great just to have a conversation about that. I think sometime just all of the rules or or not rules. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah and that's funny because that's in a way how. Um, the gradient crush pieces function because there's mm. a lot of rules within my paintings and here's something that loses its rules in a different way like right. you're not supposed to crush your painting <laughs> <laughs> why why are you cannibalizing your painting you know um, right but so it's an aggressive act but also so the title actually we were talking about this earlier ellen what is the title gradient crush i mean obviously i'm working with gradients and crush is that double entendre of it's like a kind of an aggressive act on the painting, but it's really that I have such a crush on color. Um, it's about having a it's crush color color crush color love, you know, um, and at the same time crumpling it or crushing it. But does that mean that you do not prepare your 
gradients or your colors before starting a painting and that you do it on the go and it's always kind of fresh paint going on uh yeah i mix my colors as i go is that oh. what you mean yeah, yeah 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 i mix as i go wow yeah because there's a lot of there's a lot of steps there's a lot of i would have to have so many insane jars of paint i know to, i know to get, to, get, to get this light i'm i'm very i've also been very into subtlety so these subtle color changes require mm -hmm. very small shifts in color and do you underpaint before or you 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 go on on the canvas without underpaint uh no underpainting no oh wow vibrancy is amazing those those earlier works that I mentioned, those had underpainting, right, Audrey? Well, those I guess early it, gouaches. Yeah, what is underpainted is that, like, as one color is being applied, I apply enough that it will carry across enough mm. to the next color. So each color is underpainting the one that was. Yeah. Okay. Overpainting the one that was before it. <laughs> no, it works magic. Yeah. <laughs> I sort of, um, hi, Audrey. Hi. <laughs> great, great presentation. Um, as someone who does a lot of work with space and installation, I love the idea of um, the crush being uh, your piece potentially could crush us, especially in the back entry and that idea of we're being um, consumed by the piece in that small room in the back, but we can walk around the form in the piece in the front. So I love that idea of how this space plays with our body or how we can move through that space. And I also was wondering what might happen if the gallery itself, you started to play with the walls or the ceiling or the fl floor, and that became a kind of painted space for you. Like your pieces that dealt with the ceiling, you know, what happens if, it's on the ceiling and you have a dimensional piece in there. So that might be kind of interesting to play with. Totally. I love the idea of doing a gradient crush that covers the whole floor. Mm -hmm. It could, or that falls down the wall and spills over the floor. I mean, I could see it so many ways. So um, yeah, it'd be huge. <laughs> or maybe yeah. just a very small space that has a, a, thing filling it like the back room yeah and I think the way you're talking about your the painting uh has a very sort of physical or corporeal quality to it you know we're imagining ourselves in the space then what happens if we're in the space and being surrounded maybe in the way you feel when you're painting on a two-dimensional surface you're now inviting us into that kind of three-dimensional metaphoric headspace let's say so that we're physically in there experiencing something else so yeah. exciting possibilities and good idea Ellen to have that sense of providing space you know our ability to dream about space and you know maybe not quite have the commitment of the big space to begin with but using this as a prototype to say this this is what it could look like this is how big it would be I like that idea and yeah. I'd, I'd love to have the opportunity to do that with Audrey and any of the artists that I've shown in Odetta Petite. If I uh, do get contacted by a client, uh, what would happen first is Audrey and I would go do a site visit and then the client would do a studio visit and then we would start to shape what the final work would be, which would be site specific. That would be so fun. Wouldn't it be great? Yeah. <laughs> and um, I'm just going to get messy for a minute and try and bring that little guy into view in the back. Can you see it? Uh, oh, you, a little bit. Yeah, we can see the top of it. Yeah. Yeah, I I keep hoping to have some kind of a camera that would fit on the back of a cockroach or an ant and could crawl through the entire space <laughs> filming away. Haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> you know, a mini drone. 
I, I need a mini, mini, mini drone, like the kind that you might use in a colonoscopy. I don't know. <laughs> you could you could call it small walk. <laughs> small walk. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. It it could be um could be a finger drone, you know, snaps onto your finger and you uh there you pass go. it over or a palm or whatever. The idea is forever evolving. So if you have some ideas on small cameras that I could snake through, please send me the link to Amazon or <laughs> E and H whatever. It's exist. It's gotta exist somewhere, you know. Dentists have to have it. I mean, yeah. most doctors' offices have to have it. So um mm -hmm. well. Thanks everybody. It's it's we're coming into an hour, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording unless there's any more questions that you want included in the talk here. And thanks for your input. So let me. Yeah, that's nice. Very nice.